<laughs> Good morning to each and every one of you. Good morning. And welcome to Spring Valley United Methodist Church. I am Dorado Rubel Asbel, worship leader and director of music ministries. It is so good to see each and every one of you here, but it's also good to see each and every one of you here with one of these bad boys on. Yeah, we're all on vacation today, folks. We're all on vacation so much, even Frank's sitting out in the congregation today. How about that? <laughs> Wonderful thing. Uh, once again, for those that are here as members, for those that are here as guests, uh, we are so delighted to have you here. For those that are online, we wish you could be here. Uh, and if you have a lay at home, you go ahead and put it on. You can join us and feel like you're part of the group. Uh, for those that are here this morning, please register your attendance with the green cards in front of you in the pews. Uh, and any prayer requests that you may have, please write them in as well. For those that are online, we invite you to leave a comment. Uh, with anything that's on your mind, uh, so that way we can see it and respond to you accordingly. At this time, folks, let us pray. Dear Lord, we come to you with the week that was before us, with everything going on, with everything that we have been able to experience that is now in our hearts and our minds. We lift them up to you as we come to this place ready to worship, honor, and glorify your name. For you are the sole provider that brings us hope and that brings us the happiness that dwells within our souls. It's these things that we pray forever and evermore. Amen. And at this time, folks, please stand as we sing our opening hymn. And now at this time, uh, let us affirm our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now at this time, I invite each and every one of you to exchange the peace of Christ with one another. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, welcome to worship. My name is Pastor Frank, and uh, what a joy it is to worship together. Whether we're here in the space or worshiping online, we welcome everybody into the spirit of worship together, wherever we are. Uh, we're beginning a new sermon series this, this summer. That's why we're doing all the, we're decked out with the summer party stuff, decorations everywhere. So uh, thank you for participating in that. Um, we're going to have our time of praying together now, and so I invite us to take a moment to consider uh, the things that are going on in our life, uh, the people that we love that are in need of God's grace this week, uh, many of us impacted by storms, our house without power for five days this week, and I know many of us here had similar issues, uh, but thankfully that's been restored now, and we'll pray for everybody uh, recovering from that, uh, as well as other concerns of our hearts and minds. And so as we begin with our time of prayer, we'll begin with first with silence, and this is a time to sort of gather ourselves, uh, to invite God into our lives, and then uh, I will lead us in a prayer. And our prayer this morning is a litany, meaning I will say something and then, and then you'll have a, respond, a chance to respond. So when you hear me say the words, Lord, in your mercy, you say, hear our prayer. I say, Lord, in your mercy, you say, hear our prayer. So let's go now into the ministry of prayer, beginning with silence. We come together now, holy God, to pray for the church and for the world. Grant, almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory to the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as Christ loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles. And bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we too may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We offer these, our prayers this morning through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Y'all, the lays are fun, but this thing is hot. <laughs> I, I got a stash. I, I'm sweating up here with that thing on. Okay. Uh, so I invite our ushers to come forward now that we may continue our worship through our giving. We want to say thank you to everyone who supports the ministry here at Spring Valley United Methodist Church. Whether you give online or you give automatically throughout the week or whether you give here in the moment on this Sunday, we appreciate the support. Let us pray. Lord God, all good things come from you. And we celebrate your goodness this morning, for you have gifted us with life, with grace, and with love. You've gifted us with resources that we have, Lord, and we pray that now as we share those resources with your church, that we may use them rightly, that more people may come to know your love and grace revealed to us in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray and give.
As we said before, we're starting a new sermon series today, Swimming Through Mark, for nine Sundays, all the Sundays of June and July, we'll be exploring the Gospel of Mark. Uh, Mark is a kind of a unique Gospel. It's the shortest one, the most direct one, the most clear one. And so uh, our text this morning, Mark chapter 2, beginning with verse 23, and then going on into chapter 3, and reading through verse 6. And so I invite you to listen for the word of the Lord this morning. Jesus went through the wheat fields on the Sabbath. As the disciples made their way, they were picking heads of wheat. The Pharisees said to Jesus, Look, why are they breaking the Sabbath law? And Jesus said to them, Haven't you ever read... That David, what David did when he was in need, when he and, his, and those with him were hungry? During the time when Abiathar was the high priest, David went into God's house and ate the bread of the presence, which only the priests were allowed to eat. David also gave bread to those who were with him. And then Jesus said, the Sabbath was created for humans, Humans weren't created for the Sabbath. This is why the human one is Lord even over the Sabbath. And then Jesus returned to the synagogue. A man with a withered hand was there. Wanting to bring charges against Jesus, they were watching Jesus closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the withered hand, Step up to where the people can see you. And then Jesus said, Is it legal on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill? But they said nothing. Looking around at them with anger, deeply grieved at their unyielding hearts, Jesus said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he did. And his hand was made healthy. At that, the Pharisees got together with the supporters of Herod to plan how to destroy Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, we come before you on this first Sunday of June, thankful for this hour of worship. We pray, Lord, that as we worship together, as we sing, as we receive the Lord's Supper, as we learn and grow as Christians, that the Holy Spirit will be amongst us all, that we would feel your love for us, and that we would be reminded, Lord, that each of us is a precious child of God, and that you are well pleased with all of your people. It's easy to forget, Lord that we are one of those children of God and that you are well pleased with us. And so we breathe in and rest in your peace. Lord, I pray that as I speak this morning, your word may be heard through me, if not because of me, then in spite of me. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Uh, The year was 1975. And the engineers at Kodak Corporation made a great, I don't know if you call it discovery, invention, the ability to take digital photos. 1975. Now, Kodak was a film company, right? At the time, Kodak was one of the largest companies in America. It was one of the largest companies in the world. And they made this discovery Their engineers created this thing, digital photography. Wow, what should we do with this thing? Well, we're a film company. Uh, We exist to help people, you know, take pictures on film. And now we have this new technology. We're not sure what to do with it. We'll put it in a vault and think about it. Which they did. They patented it. They put it away. And they talked about it. What should we do? Uh, Over time, their engineers got together, and they said, hey, we're we're also a camera company. We make film. Yes, we we are a film company, but we also make cameras. What if we made a digital camera? 
And so they designed a digital camera. It cost $20,000, this digital camera. So they had the technology, they had the idea, they saw the purpose, they created a product, but we're a film company. We're not a digital company. When was the last time you bought a Kodak camera? <laughs> See, over time, Kodak, one of the all-time most successful corporations, plummeted, right? To where it barely even exists today. Not because they didn't have great ideas. Not because they weren't innovative. They didn't understand that people change over time and companies ought to change to meet current need. Uh, another example. Okay. I was, there's this thing about new technology when things come out. There are people who are early adopters. There are people, it's about 13% of the people. There are another 30% or so who who see their friends who are early adopters and they say, oh yeah, that, that's really cool, I'm going to get that thing too. And then the majority of people just kind of wait. And once the thing is established, once it makes sense, then they'll get on board and then there's not about another 13% that just never ever will do it. You can't convince them at all. I was one, when it came to cell phones, I was one on that second half. Like, I don't really need to be reached all the time. And so I resist having a cell phone to, for a long time until I became a solo pastor and then I saw, okay, now there is a need for me to have a cell phone. But for a long time, I just had a little flip phone and it worked just fine. I couldn't figure out how to text or anything. People could just call me or they could email me. And then this invention came out that touched my heart in a very special way. It was called Blackberry. <laughs> When BlackBerry came out, again, I was a late adopter because BlackBerry had been used in, in corporate America for years and years. But once it got down to people like me, ordinary people, I'm just going, oh, this little thing, it has this keyboard to it. And I can, I can email and text. And I can write, it, it fits in my pocket. Oh, this is, I love this thing. It made my life simple. It was fun. And then... This thing happened. The iPhone came out. This was like 2012 or something like that. And I was never going to do it. Like, it doesn't have a keyboard. It doesn't, it's no good for me. Forget it. I'm not interested. I've got my BlackBerry. And BlackBerry Corporation was just like me. We already have a great market share. We, we've, we've got tremendous resources. This thing doesn't have a keyboard. No one's going to want this thing. When was the last time you bought a BlackBerry? <laughs> Y'all, I can't tell you the moment I was late to a meeting trying to get to a church. I had my BlackBerry out trying to find out where this church was. The BlackBerry couldn't. It broke my heart. It was like, this is the final thing. I got an iPhone. What's the next big thing likely to fail if it doesn't innovate? For me, and this is even closer to my heart than Blackberry, it's cinemas. I love going to the movies. Y'all know I'm a movie guy already. You know that. But I love going to the movie theater. I love it. I've been, in May, I went to like six movies in May. I went to Back to the Future. I went to Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, I went to Furiosa, I went to uh, The Fall Guy, thank you, yes, he's been, he's been listening, he's been listening, good. Um, I went to Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace, that's just five right there that I can remember. I love going to the movies. When I went to the Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, this was like opening weekend, I think, it might have been the weekend after, I went into this giant cinema and there were like eight people in the auditorium with me. When I went in, I, I, as I said, I love cinemas. I want to support them. I want them to succeed. Where do cinemas get their money from? Not the movie studios. 
not from ticket sales, from concessions, right? So I want to support. So I went, I want to get a Slurpee and a snack, some, some, some Reese's Pieces. There's nobody at the counter. There's just this giant touch screen here. I don't want to do that. I want to talk to somebody. We're, there are people out sorting popcorn, doing, but no one's paying attention to me. And I felt like, okay, I guess I just have to do this. And so I'm just, again, I'm a, I'm a late adopter when it comes to touch screen stuff. I'm like, touch, okay, what do I do? What do I, and finally someone took mercy on the old man and came up and helped me. And even she said, oh, I didn't know it could do that. Wait, you work here? <laughs> so what, what's going on with the, with the, with the movie business? Hollywood is spending $200 million on these massive summer movies and they're opening to like $30 million revenue. Where they're hoping for 55, they're getting 23 million. And people are like, what's going on with the movies? Do people not, not, not like movies anymore? No, people love movies. They don't like going to the cinemas anymore. Why? Because no one will help them. No, there's no staff. You've got to sit through 45 minutes of commercials and then 30 minutes of movie trailers before you get to your movie? Why would I want to do all that stuff when I can just sit at home and tell my television to show me Planet of the Apes? Why would I do that? Why would I pay $20 for a bucket of popcorn when I can make it myself for $1.50? Why would I do that? I love the cinemas, but my industry that I have supported since I was like five is letting me down. Five years from now, will there still be movie houses to go to? I don't know. Will we talk about, y'all, when I came to Dallas to go to seminary, I worked at a cinema. I worked until three in the morning making popcorn, cleaning auditorium. I know what that thing was like. It's hard work. Will there be cinemas left to go to? I mean, Furioso was this big, giant movie, great movie. When I saw it, there were 10 people in the auditorium. When I saw Back to the Future a couple days later, the thing was 97% full. Is that the market? Just to old people like me? Movies from the 80s or older than that? So Jesus shows up, and as Mark tells the story, Jesus was a disruptor. Mark doesn't, Mark is a very direct kind of writer. So Mark doesn't really, he's not interested in flowery stories. So Matthew, Luke, angels appear to shepherds, announcing the Lord's birth, right? Wise men journey thousands of miles from the east to visit the Christ child. Mark's like, yeah, Jesus was born one time. Uh, the other gospel writers are like, Jesus was baptized and the heavens opened up and the spirit of the Lord came down in the form of a dove and a voice said, this is my son, listen to him. And Mark's like, yeah, Jesus was baptized one time. The other writers are like, Jesus went to the, te- to the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days and, and, and uh, the devil took him to the top of the temple, jump off, took him to these other places. You can have all the kingdoms of the world if you worship me. Mark's like, yeah, Jesus was tempted. Where's the narrative? Where are the stories? The Easter story, the resurrection of Jesus. Mark's like, yeah, people went. They left terrified. Jesus doesn't even show up in Mark's resurrection story. What's this thing even about? It's about people. How Jesus interacts with people in a way that is disruptive. Kind of like the iPhone. Kind of like Netflix. Meeting people where they are and what they need rather than what the institution says. So Mark sets up the conflict between Jesus and the institution really early. In chapter 2 of Mark, Jesus is eating with sinners. And the religious leaders, the scribes, the the students of the Pharisees, he doesn't even know who he's eating with. Why is he eating with sinners? Mark says that Jesus had his disciples, one version said, uh, randomly walking through, I don't think it was random at all. I think Jesus was very calculated. Walking through the the fields, gathering grain, 
on the Sabbath. Why are your disciples doing that? In the worship service, someone who's in need of healing, healing that person. Mark says they were watching him to see what he would do. In the Gospel of John, there's the same conflict between Jesus and the religious people. But it starts with Nicodemus coming to visit Jesus at night, one-on-one, -on -one, in a neutral place. I mean, we've heard you're doing great things. We'd like to know more. Tell us more about what you're doing. In Mark, it's just like instant warfare. Let's just go. Let's go right now. Why are your disciples doing that? Is it lawful to do this on the Sabbath? This conflict starts. And y'all, I don't want to, I want us to resist the urge to just say that Pharisees are just being Pharisees. That they're the bad guys in the story. That Pharisees weren't bad guys. This was their training. They went to school to be like this. They, they were identified as, as the young bright stars as children and, and went to school with the best and smartest of rabbis to be trained. And so they're just interpreting their faith just as you and I would, just from a different perspective. But it's a very black and white thing, right? Why are your people not doing the things as we've been trained to do them? Not to start a dialogue, but to be accusational. And I just have to say, I think Jesus was seeking that, at least from Mark's perspective. Because Jesus doesn't try to bring them into the conversation. Matter of fact, when Jesus sees the guy in the synagogue who's in need of healing, Jesus says, come to the front and center so that everybody can see. And it says, Mark tells us, that Jesus was angry at the heart condition of everyone else around. So it's very intentional to start off this conflict to uh, one against the other. Jesus was a disruptor. How ironic is it then that the church is often the institution that has the hardest time being disruptive. How ironic is it that it's the church that's often pointing at others, why are you doing that that you are doing? What are you doing that is wrong rather than how we do it? When that wasn't how Jesus was. Jesus was showed up to challenge the system to produce a better result, right? As much as I love the cinema industry, the church is my first love. Yeah? I've been in the church since 1971. And how is the church adjusting to the world around it? How is the world perceiving the church in what the church is doing or not doing? Because that's what matters, right? Kodak. Blackberry, the cinemas, are they meeting where people were meeting people where they are and meeting the need that people have? Or are we digging out trenches in order to have warfare? Jesus calls for disruption, but not it doesn't have to be a conflict based disruption. It's a way for us to re-examine what we're doing and why we're doing so that the love of Jesus is seen and experienced by more people rather than fewer people. Yeah? So as we begin swimming through Mark, I invite us to think about Jesus as a disruptor, how Jesus might be disrupting us, even here at Spring Valley, how Jesus might be disrupting the United Methodist Church, the denomination. And, and how we're going to respond to that by pointing fingers and accusing people for not doing things the way we do them, believing things the way we believe, or expanding to meet people where they are. I invite us to think about those things. Uh, in, you know, we've been looking at the windows around the, around the building. In that back corner over there, not, not all the way to the end, that's, that's the new, new Jerusalem from Revelation 21. But a little bit further, there's a guy on a horseback. 
That's a Methodist circuit rider in the early days. This is where we get monthly communion, by the way, because you only saw your pastor once a month. There's no reason why it shouldn't be weekly. It, that's the only reason. It's just a habit. That, that's, that's the plain truth. Uh, next to that is uh, the Christmas conference, 17, what is that, 84, 89, something like that, in Baltimore, where the Methodist Church in America was born. Next to that are, I think those are early, those are people praying together, being sent out by pastors. I think that's right. Anyway, the point is, when the Wesley brothers began the Methodist movement, it was also a disruption. Not meant to be a separate denomination, but a renewal movement within the Church of England. And the Wesley brothers were invited by the church to no longer do that in the church's pulpits. And so Wesley literally preached standing on his father's grave to crowds of people. Wesley went into the fields where people were to preach the gospel. Disruption is part of the Methodist DNA. Not something to be afraid of, something to embrace. Again, that more people may know the love of Christ as we do. So as we swim through Mark, let's remember Jesus as a disruptor. And think about how disruption may be a good thing for us here at Spring Valley and as a denomination. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Another thing that Jesus disrupted was the practice of Passover. Jesus gathered with his disciples on pass to observe the Passover meal. They had the meal together, but then at the end of the meal, Jesus said, I'm giving you something new tonight. A meal that will be a remembrance of me forever. A meal that will bless you with my real presence, even in ordinary things like bread and grape juice. As we come to celebrate the Lord's Supper, it's a tradition of our church to invite everyone to the table because it's the Lord's table. It's not mine. It's not Spring Valley's. It's not the United Methodist Church's table. It's Jesus's table. That means that we're all welcome to come. Uh, When we come, there'll be two stations of people here, four people total. You will be given a piece of bread. You'll dip the bread into the cup and take bread and juice together in one bite. If you put the bread in your mouth before dipping into the cup, swallow that one. Get another piece of bread. Dip it into the cup. Take both elements together. And then following receiving communion, you're welcome to come to pray at the altar as long as you want. The choir will lead us in that. They'll be served first. The ushers will guide you down the middle aisle. So I invite you to prepare your hearts and minds to share in the Lord's Supper. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, our Alpha and Omega, whose strong and loving arms encompass the universe. For with your eternal word and Holy Spirit, you are forever one God. Through your word, you created all things and called them good. And in you, we live and move and have our being. When we fell into sin, your love did not desert us. You made covenant with your people, Israel, and spoke through your prophets and teachers. In Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is Jesus Christ, who called you Abba, Father. As a mother tenderly gathers her children, you embraced a people as your own and filled them with a longing for a peace that would last and for a justice that would never fail. In Jesus' suffering and death, 
you took upon yourself our sin and death and destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead the same Jesus who now reigns with you in glory and poured upon us your Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new covenant. On the night before meeting with death, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to the disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts, that in the breaking of this bread and the drinking of this juice, we may know the presence of the living Christ and be renewed as the body of Christ for the world, redeemed by Christ's blood. As the grain and grapes, once dispersed in the fields, are now united on this table in bread and juice, so may we and all your people be gathered from every time and place into the unity of your eternal household and feast at your table forever. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, we pray together as the Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The body of Christ broken for us all. The blood of Christ poured out for us all. I invite our servers to come.
And at this time, as we close out our worship, uh, we invite you to please stand as we sing our closing hymn, uh, Heal Me, Hands of Jesus.
We go out now into the world, a world that's always changing and moving, right? Amen. And God calls us to change and move as well. And so we go in the peace of Christ, knowing that Christ calls us to be disruptors every now and then, that the love of Christ may be expanded for more people to know the love of God for them. Go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.